Our guest today is Heather Fisher. Heather Fisher became involved in combating human trafficking as a volunteer in a small Connecticut nonprofit. She became the first ever White House Special Advisor assigned to combat human trafficking and is now the Senior Advisor for Human Rights Crimes at Thomson Reuters Special Services. Her experience includes working at the U.S. Department of State, focused on civilian security, democracy, human rights, and combating human trafficking, and as a subject matter expert on human trafficking at the McCain Institute for International Leadership. Heather Fisher, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thanks for having me on your show today, Chris. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Now, likewise, we'll get into uh, academics later, but I have to start the show just by saying go orange. Uh, so we'll, we'll go from there. You recently joined Thomson Reuters Special Services as a Senior Advisor for Human Rights Crimes. When many people here, and myself included, Thomson Reuters, they think of it as a newswire service. Set us straight on what Thomson Reuters Special Services is and does, and why it would bring in someone with your expertise to combat human trafficking. I'd be happy to. And uh, Chris, Thomson Reuters, our parent company, is a leading global data and technology company. So yes, Thomson Reuters owns Reuters Reporting, so I am often mistaken for a journalist. That's one part of our business. Thomson Reuters Special Services, or TRSS, where I sit, was stood up um, as a wholly owned U.S. subsidiary to do classified contract work for the U.S. government. And up until recently, the bulk of our work was on national security. And how did Thompson Reuters Special Services get involved in combating human trafficking? And why is it important to the company to do something about it? Well, I first heard about TRSS when I was at the McCain Institute for International Leadership. And my partners at Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, told me that they were going to do a pilot project in the state of Florida to address sex trafficking and illicit massage businesses. And I have to say, I was quite skeptical at first. Many data and tech companies talk about how they can address human trafficking and perhaps they'll do a pro bono project or um, hackathon of sorts and then peter out after some time. So I was sort of waiting to see if the project between HSI and TRSS would bear any fruit. And so after a year or so, to my delight and surprise, I got a report from my colleagues at HSI that the project was so successful that they were going to scale it to other field offices across the United States. So I then reached out directly to TRSS to get a briefing from Jim Dinkins, who is now my boss here at TRSS and our president. And after seeing the briefing, I understood that sort of beneath the surface was this sophisticated transnational organized crime operation that was luring foreign nationals from China, Korea, um, and other countries into Flushing, New York, or California on the promises of a good, legitimate job in the hospitality industry or some other vocation, um, and then placing them into massage establishments and strip malls across the United States to actually perform sex acts. And then money laundering the profits back to the country of origin, and I was just, I was stunned. I had no idea that this was transnational organized crime. And from there, I really wanted to know what else TRSS could do to address human rights crimes. So I spend my days here thinking about how we can use the tools, technology, and data we have historically used to protect the homeland and work with the team here to reimagine them now to protect human rights as well. Your job title is Senior Advisor for Human Rights Crimes at Thomson Reuters Special Services. Do human rights crimes extend beyond human trafficking? And if so, help us understand the full scope of human rights crimes of your work. So I very much still focus on human trafficking, but I've formally broadened my work portfolio to include other areas of human rights abuses that I've worked on over the years, such as online child exploitation, human rights violators and war crimes offenders, and then post-Afghanistan evacuation. We intentionally added a pillar on promoting women's peace and security, something that was really important to me and the rest of the leadership here at TRSS. And your focus is on the crisis in Ukraine right now. What does your work entail there? So one of the projects I can share about is our work to understand the trends related to the demand for sexual exploitation of Ukrainian refugee women and girls. And one of our analysts at TRSS did a review of data trends and his analysis showed that there was an uptick in the demand for Ukrainian women and girls for sexual exploitation that massively spiked after the war broke out on February 24th. We unfortunately saw increases anywhere from 300 to 600% in several European countries. And I was devastated to hear the reports, but somehow not surprised. And we also saw that human traffickers were racing to prey on those who were fleeing Ukraine as a response to this increase in demand coming from European men 
for sex with refugees. So we shared our findings with the U.S. government and then with intergovernmental organizational leadership, which led to a public-private partnership with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or more commonly known as the OSCE. It's an intergovernmental organization made up of 57 countries that includes the U.S. and Canada. Can you tell us more about your partnership with the OSCE, please? Yeah, I'd love to. So we, we brought our findings to the special representative and coordinator for trafficking human beings at the OSCE, my colleague Val Ritchie, who is the ambassador level leadership and my former counterpart there. And our, our data confirmed what the OSCE team was already hearing anecdotally. So last May, Val invited me to speak at a joint OSCE United Nations meeting in Croatia, where I shared our findings with member countries. And while we were arming policymakers and government officials with timely, actionable um, data snapshots that helped inform their policy, we wanted to do more. So our communications team had this big idea to support an awareness campaign, and we were able to pull resources from across Thomson Reuters to develop a joint OSE, Thomson Reuters Human Trafficking Campaign, directly for Ukrainians with the critical information and how they can keep themselves safe from sexual exploitation, human trafficking. And so what we did was we put it in their language, we put official government hotlines tied to each country so that as people are making their accommodation, they're getting information on their phone and they're able to know the signs of human trafficking, know what to do to secure um, uh, safe accommodation. And then if they are in a position where they are being exploited, they know who to reach out to. So. It's been great work across the board. We're very fortunate to bring this public-private partnership to bear to really help um, prevent human trafficking of such vulnerable Ukrainian folks. Is there a name for that campaign? It's called the Be Safe campaign. So if you go to helpforukrainians.info, which we're happy to share, and the notes or other places with your audience, um, you can find all the campaign information there. Are there ways that our listeners and viewers can support the Be Safe campaign? Absolutely, and I'm hoping you will. So our ask to the audience here today is really simple. One, add your voice to our unified efforts, and two, amplify the campaign through your social media channels, and three, consider sharing the campaign with your customers, your suppliers, friends, and family, and really help us spread the word. And where do the Ukrainians who fall into the hands of human trafficking end up? Or where, where will they end up? You know, you mentioned Flushing, New York, you mentioned California. Yeah, that's a great question. And Chris, really, they could end up anywhere, including our southern border. And just this morning, I heard a report um, of two cases where Ukrainian victims of sex trafficking were in New York City. So it's a little too soon to tell. We know, of course, they're going to the neighboring countries. But here in the United States, we also have to be alert um, and be on the lookout for folks who, who might need our help who have um, be are at risk of human trafficking or have already ex experienced signs of exploitation. And what can we realistically expect for those women, children, and in some cases, men? How many will get free of traffickers and how would that happen? Yeah, I don't know if I could say how many, but I think that's why this campaign is so important is because we really need to activate the eyes and ears of every community to um, tangibly be in a position to help. And I, I think that'll look like reaching out to hotlines and law enforcement, victim service providers to not just respond, which is really important, but also tie um, folks to community-based services where they can get safe housing and they can get uh, job security and employment where uh, otherwise they might fall prey to traffickers who are luring and grooming them with false promises of legitimate um, business, but may actually have an ulterior motive. And so I think um, we will know in the coming years how many people fell um, victim to the human trafficking schemes, but the more we can do proactively and preventatively, I think the more success we'll have of making sure that people aren't falling into the schemes that human traffickers are trying to lure and groom them into currently. And how long do you expect to remain focused on Ukraine and then where is the focus likely to shift? Or is it just too hard to tell? I mean, for as long as it takes, I think um, for us, uh, we're in it for the long haul. And I think there's no quick fix for this situation. Uh, Ukrainians, historically, women and girls have already been trafficked for sex trafficking. And this just exacerbates the situation. And so I think 
um, we are wholly committed to ensuring that we're supporting um, a whole of society approach to make sure that we're not just preventing human trafficking, but also taking care of those who have unfortunately already experienced exploitation. And does this exploitation of refugees happen in every big conflict? Yeah, and to that point, I'm thinking, for example, of the Syria conflict and the wave of refugees to Europe happened you know, just a handful of years ago. Mm -hmm. It can and it often does. I think uh, crisis and chaos unfortunately creates the opportune environment for traffickers to prey on some of the most vulnerable. And for as long as there's a demand um, for either sex trafficking or forced labor, uh, traffickers will continue to respond to that because it's an economically motivated crime. It's upwards of 1.5 billion dollars annually in profits in the shadow economy, and so I think it takes the society um, to respond to to each conflict and crisis that happens. What's new about the work that we're doing in Ukraine is that as a former policy person, I was never really armed with this type of information. And so I'm really grateful to now sit on the side here where we can actually go right to governments and leaders and say, this is what we're seeing in real time and help um, allocate resources. And so that's what's new. Um, human trafficking is not new, but I think leveraging data and technology to really go upstream with a new approach is something that I'm hopeful we can continue to do in each conflict moving forward. And let's level, level set some basic facts about human trafficking. Is human trafficking just another name for smuggling or is it something completely different? That's a great question. I get this all the time and I'm so glad you asked it because I'm hoping that I can dispel this myth. Human trafficking is not synonymous with human smuggling. Human trafficking is a crime against a person and the means are through force, fraud or coercion. Um, and human smuggling is a crime against the border. It is true that sometimes human smuggling leads to human trafficking because of the vulnerabilities that exist for somebody who can't seek um, employment legitimately here in the United States. But we also see human trafficking happening here in our local communities. And it's primarily through two forms, um, sex trafficking and then forced labor. And we see it in construction, we see it in nail salons, we see it um, in brothels, but then we also see it in agricultural sectors as well. So it takes many shapes and forms, but I think that's um, really important that we see them as two distinct crimes, and certainly the U.S. government does. And who are the victims? Do they always come from low-income backgrounds? So that's a great question. I think, um, yes, uh, people who have ad high adverse childhood experiences scores or have come from um, historical uh, trauma and abuse situations are probably most at risk and also those who face socioeconomic challenges. But trafficking can happen anywhere and it can happen to anyone. And so some of the most horrific cases that I've ever been a part of have been in very affluent parts of the country. Um, where families are sort of asking themselves, how did this happen? And I think that's because um, traffickers often prey on emotional vulnerability as well. So there's sort of a constellation of factors. And we know that traffickers primarily um, lure and groom girls, uh, women, women of color, and um, people who have nowhere else to turn to. And so that is the majority of um, what we see. But Definitely, um, trafficking can happen to anyone from any background, unfortunately. You know, a, a mutual friend of ours, Andy Berger, has been on the show a few times and, and talking about it. And to your point, she's like, it can be anywhere. It's the white picket fence place in the most affluent communities. And so you always have to be on alert and just say, you know, hopefully you have to ask the question of how did this happen in my neighborhood? Because hopefully people just see things or are aware of things that, that, that are going on. I think that's a great point. And I'll just add here, Chris, um, when I lived in upstate New York, I lived in a very affluent community and it was shocking to many when the lead business women and soccer moms of the community were being lured and groomed by Keith Ranieri, um, who stood up a cult and literally was branding um, some of the most affluent women in our community to be a part of his, his scheme. Um, Jeffrey Epstein is a really another good example where um, it doesn't necessarily happen in motels and hotels, though it does. And so I think we need to kind of dispel the myth that this doesn't happen um, in sleepy, small communities. It can happen anywhere. So it's not just like you see in the movies. It's actually anywhere in America or anywhere globally. That's right. 
So how are children and young people typically drawn into human trafficking situations? You mentioned low income, you mentioned at-risk youth in terms of difficult situations. Are there other factors that come into play? So these days we see social media plays a big part in the luring and grooming process. Um, Oftentimes uh, somebody will reach out to a young person and present as someone they're not, someone that they could trust, someone who is perhaps romantically interested in them. And they, they build rapport in a relationship, especially with children and young people. And it could start pretty much very harmless though, over the course of six months. Um, it just sort of escalates to a place where they may be um, exchanging sexual images. And then that person is using the Im- images against them to um, get involved in other schemes such as sex trafficking. And not every online exploitation experience leads to trafficking, but in almost every human trafficking situation that I've been a part of, that online experience and social media has really been a part of it. We mentioned Ukraine a few moments ago, and I, I know your role is focused here domestically. Russia's role in human trafficking is not limited to its current assault on Ukraine. The latest report on human trafficking puts Russia at the top of the list of worst countries. If you go back a few years to say 2013, they were considered the worst country back then too. What is it about Russia that makes that such a bad place in terms of human trafficking? Well, I guess this is where I get a little philosophical and if you'll just bear with me, I think um, in countries where communism and organized crime flourish, we often see that people are just um, a part of the economic toll. Um, there is here in the United States a sense that people are created with dignity, inherent dignity and respect, and they're entitled to freedom and liberty. And that unfortunately is not found um, across the world. And, and those values that we hold so dear here um, are in conflict with some of the communist countries. And so I think that's probably one of the reasons why uh, human trafficking flourishes there. I'm sure there's many others, but from my perspective, I think it's just this different set of values where um, that person uh, is is really there to turn a profit and to make sure that their government flourishes versus here, we just have a very different approach in how we value individuals. And so I'm assuming with China being ranked second on this year's list and also second in 2013, It'd be that same philosophy. That's right. And China's biggest issue right now really relates to the forced labor of ethnic and religious minorities, such as the Uyghur population, Kazakhs, Christians, and others who are unfortunately sent to re-education camps where they're forced to work in factories making goods that are then oftentimes shipped to the United States. And so the U.S. government has taken a really strong stance on not allowing the importation of those goods. So I worked for several years um, while in the U.S. government trying to figure out how we can be um, disentangled from those goods and not be complicit in uh, China's schemes to um, to use forced labor and their global supply chains. Other countries on this list include Afghanistan, Myanmar, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, South Sudan, Syria, Turkmenistan, and Yemen. The list goes on and on. Are there common denominators with those countries or is each country its own story when it comes to human trafficking? So I'm sure there are slight differences, but I would think um, with large in those countries, we see that oftentimes there's state-imposed forced labor or state-sponsored forced labor by the government. There's a lack of democracy and where we see no rule of law and democracy or a weak rule of law. Slavery and, and exploitation, unfortunately, flourishes. Is there a connection between terrorist groups and human trafficking? Uh, For sure, but it's really not well understood or researched at this point. So ISIL, um, even in Libya with Muammar uh, Gaddafi and Boko Haram, those are all really good examples. Many people might remember the Bring Back Our Girls campaign. Um, But this is why I continue to push the intelligence community to dig into their human rights abuses and their threat environments not up to the non-governmental organizations or even the international organizations to take down this threat. It's really not their place. Um, The traffickers that are in these environments are a national security threat. They often undermine our economy. And I think we can do more to really engage the national security apparatus to really root out human trafficking, but there's more work to be done there for sure. So I just listed the worst countries. 
are there bright spots in the fight against human trafficking? You know, for instance, are we seeing countries where human trafficking is on the decline? So reports may be um, down, uh, but I'm not sure that we have enough what we call monitoring and evaluation over a long period of time to really demonstrate impact. I will say that efforts are for sure at all time high in many countries, and that includes the United States. And in 2020, the U.S. put forward its first national action plan to combat human trafficking. And I've been really fortunate to work with a great group of individuals over the course of my career here in the United States um, to set up more and more efforts. And that's a whole society approach that takes the criminal justice approach, the public health approach, and really community-based work and the U.S. government funding that at levels like we've never funded before in the past several years. So I'm really proud of the accomplishments and the record that we have set forth as the U.S. government. And I think there's always more to be done, but um, we're, we've taken, um, I think, the lead, and that's a bright spot for me. So we've been talking a lot about other countries. How pervasive and destructive is human trafficking in the United States? So um, unfortunately, our statistics aren't great. And I think the economic toll, the cost to society um, globally we've seen is 24.9 million people who are impacted each year. Throughout the United States, we've, we've only really kept track of how many reports are being made to the hotline. So um, the National Human Trafficking Hotline that's run by Polaris, I think the last report I saw from 2020, we saw roughly around 10,000 reports. But we know that pales in comparison to the actual um, you know, scale of what's happening here uh, in the United States. And so we have to be focused on making sure that we are raising awareness so that some of those reports are being made to the hotline. Because right now, it largely operates in the shadow, what we call the shadow economy. And so I don't even think we're picking up a tithe of what is happening here in the United States, unfortunately. And you started this line of work as a volunteer for a small nonprofit just down the road from me in New Haven, Connecticut. What was the name of that nonprofit and what drew you to them? And what did you do as a volunteer? Yeah, this is a, you know, great story. So I actually, um, the name of the nonprofit is Love 146 and um, for the first 10 years that I knew about human trafficking, I didn't get involved. Um, when I was graduating from college, uh, you know, a group of my friends were sort of selling everything they had to move to Southeast Asia to work with children who were being sought and, um, uh, bought and sold in, in brothels. And for me, I'm a total empath. I felt like that was really dark and I was so grateful somebody was working on it, but I didn't want it to be me. And even if it was me, I didn't really know how I would contribute to such an effort. And so a friend of mine invited me to come out to hear Rob Morris, who's the CEO and president of Love 146, um, give a presentation. And he shared a very honest portrayal of what was happening in some dark corners of the world. But then he went on to tell the rest of the story, which is that survivors of human trafficking are incredibly resilient and they can and do go on to do amazing things. But only if people like you and I, Chris, are thin skin enough to care to really jump in and, and make a difference and bring those resources to bear. So after I heard that message, I thought, I'm in. <laughs> I don't know what I can do, but I just raised my hand and I said that I would volunteer. And that was how I uh, how I got involved in this work. And look at you now. That's right. From, from volunteering to phenomenal. So how did Love 146 get its name? So um, Rob Morris, the president and CEO of Love 146 that I referenced, he took a trip to Southeast Asia after hearing what was happening with a uh, nonprofit called International Justice Mission. And he was able to be a part of sort of an undercover operation where he could go see firsthand what was happening um, uh, in Southeast Asia. And so he went into a brothel and when he was um, face to face with children who were lined up in matching red dresses, um, they had pins uh, and, and numbers pinned to their dresses. Um, and there was one girl there who was just this defiantly hopeful young person, young girl who was staring back at these Johns, looking at them like, you can buy me, but you can't have me. And the rest of the girls, unfortunately, 
um, you know, were disassociated. They were um, not looking back. They were just sort of checked out. Uh, and this one girl that was staring defiantly back at these customers, she was number 146. And so in honor of her, um, we have just, you know, the organization has felt like it's really important to remember the individual and not get lost in an issue or cause. And the love part comes from um, what fuels the organization. And, and Rob says they could have been Rage 146 or Vengeance 146, but really taking after uh, Dr. King and his mandate that it takes love to fuel great change. And so that's the that's the root of the name of Love 146. And it, it's just a tremendous, small but mighty nonprofit. I'm so great, grateful that I got to cut my teeth with such a wonderful organization. That's an amazing story. Uh, thank you for sharing that with our listeners. And to that point, you've seen and lived through many tragic stories as you've done your work. Do some of them affect you more than others? Yeah, I think so. I mean, every story is unique and different and, um, you know, unimaginable in their own way. But a lot of the work that we did out of the Philippines, I think probably sticks with me the most. There was one particular case. Um, this offender was termed the world's worst pedophile. And uh, we had such tremendous uh, struggles bringing him to justice. He was an Australian and the kids that we brought into care at Love 146 that had survived um, because several of their siblings didn't make it. Unfortunately, they were murdered. Um, they just couldn't see, get justice in their cases. And so I was very fortunate to be a part of the team that helped liaise through U.S. law enforcement back to the Philippines. And after four years or so, I believe it, we finally were able to secure justice for those children. And I think um, here in the United States, sometimes we take a rule of law for granted. Uh, and I don't so much. I, you know, I think in places like we talked about where there is no rule of law or a weak rule of law, um, they understand that what justice means to them. And it's a really part, important part of the restorative process. And I don't think I realized for me even uh, the impact that it, you know, had on me until um, those kids really received justice. And I felt like it was almost like taking a backpack off of weight and setting it aside and feeling like, okay, I can move on what's next. Um, and so that was one case that thankfully had uh, justice in the end, but not every case does. And so I think there, it's a challenge. It really is really um, some hard work to, to be done still. Combating human trafficking has to be obviously very demanding and draining as you talked about the backpack of weight. And you've been at it for 12 years now. Resiliency is an essential trait. Where do you find your reservoir strength and resilience? Well, that's a great um, question. And I think for me early on, I really had to embed myself in an amazing community of people who were doing this work together. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to Love 146. It's what it, uh, attracted me to the mission in the U.S. government, the McCain Institute, and also here at TRSS. I think. Um, for me, balancing out the darkness with just things that kind of fuel me. And that could be anything from uh, going out and enjoying a concert or spending time with loved ones and really being intentional to have parity between um, things that really do bring me joy and strength and um, to kind of be a balance and a counterweight to some of the, the really tough work. But it's been a tremendous team that I've worked with over the past 12 years, and we've really worked in lockstep, and they've gone on to become some of my closest friends and confidence. So it's not just <laughs> it's not just a job. It really is a calling, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that also my faith really fuels me. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes I don't give enough um, credit to the to how that's really sustained me, but for me, that's that's really how I've been able to kind of pursue this for the long haul and not just have it be sort of a quick um, response to human trafficking, but just keep going day to day. Well, your point about faith, you know, we're all here on earth for just a short period of time in terms of history uh, with the goal, hopefully to make it a better place than we got here. And so you're certainly doing that. So I appreciate the work and the effort that you're putting into that. I know it's not easy stuff. Well, thanks, Chris. Honestly, it's just such a privilege to do. And I'm not surprised that was your response. <laughs> Your career has been unusual and extraordinary beyond your work in human trafficking. Would you talk about your work at the U.S. State Department and the role of women in national security? 
I'd love to. So it's funny, I was just talking about this at another venue. I was on this panel called Women in National Security. And I was with, you know, some of these amazing women, former State Department, former White House, who really um, started this work. I just happened to be able to work it on it um, in a more technical way here from TRSS. But uh, you know, the Charity Wallaces, the Anita McBrides and Undersecretary Dabronsky and other women um, who came before me were really thinking about the intersection of this work. And, and it really is under the umbrella of women's peace and security. And for some reason, um, we don't see things in silos. This work has a lot of push-pull factors. And I think um, I'm just very fortunate that I can be hyper-focused on the intersection of of human rights and national security and make it my full-time job. But I don't think that that's anything new. I think we're just looking to make it more fashionable and um, invite others to come link arms with us and, and continue to march forward. You were the first United States senior official to serve as a special advisor for human trafficking in the executive office of the president or the White House human trafficking czar. Human trafficking has been a problem for decades, which we know. What took so long? Why did it take until 2020 for a president to elevate the issue? I'd love to know that as well, I think. I, you know, Congress um, has done an exceptional job over the past 22 years now, making this a bipartisan issue. Um, and I think the agencies have kept pace with a lot of the activities that were tasked upon them. But, um, you know, it, I think it took some creativity from the executive office of the president, from President Trump, to think what more we could be doing as, as a nation and how we could continue to prioritize it. And so I'm really grateful um, that he took that unique step. I think it was needed. We do have a tremendous office at the State Department called the Trafficking Persons Office, where there's an ambassador at the helm. But I think having somebody in the White House directing the day-to-day -day and coordinating across the executive office and the president, which does include Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council to really leverage that all of government approach that we talk about, but to really do it and to put in those pathways and then to engage every agency who sits on the president's task force for combating human trafficking and to say, here's the priority and here's your marching orders and really making sure that you have that person who's the tip of the spear to make sure that's all happening. Um, I don't know why it took so long, but it was desperately needed. And I'm, I'm really hoping actually the administration, currently the Biden-Harris administration will also appoint a human trafficking czar because that position still exists and it doesn't need Senate confirmation. And so I'm hoping they can continue to carry forward the really good work that we implemented. And your position, as you mentioned, was created in 2021 by executive order as President Trump marked the 20th anniversary of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act with federal legislation to help combat human trafficking. How did the U.S. government's approach to the human trafficking crisis evolve over the 20 years? You know, what did we get right and what did we fail to do during that time? Well, I hate to be um, a critic of, uh, you know, my colleagues who really were just scratching out of the earth, right? What does this work look like? And I think what we got right was that we need to respond. And so we saw a lot of work to really help protect victims and make sure they were getting the resources that they need and sort of that crisis urgency. Um, so I would say probably the first 20 years were dedicated to our victim protection work and also our criminal justice work. What we didn't spend so much time on was on prevention. And so within the um, human trafficking field, we have the three Ps um, as we call them, it's protection, prevention, and prosecution. And then of course, partnership is, is really an important piece as well. So I think um, where we still have a lot of room um, to grow on is prevention efforts and then also the partnership piece. I think that's why I'm so encouraged about the work that we're doing with the OSCE and the US government really from the private sector. And I would love to see other corporations jump in to figure out what their role is to play because I've learned um, US government can only and maybe should only do so much. What we really need is other people to come alongside and marry up and make sure that we are force multipliers to each other um, to really get the job done. And before you joined the administration, you support the work of Cindy McCain, the late Senator John McCain's wife. 
mm-hmm. Combat Human Trafficking for the McCain Institute for International Leadership at Arizona State University. What were the highlights of your work at the McCain Institute? Well, if if anybody here has ever met Cindy McCain, you know that this is one of her top priorities and she will grab anybody's ear and talk about human trafficking, whether they want to hear it or not. And so I was so grateful to her because she made human trafficking a topic of conversation in Washington, um, obviously on the Hill, but at dinner parties where people didn't want to talk about this issue. And so even just her bringing um, people to the forefront to connect and convene to talk about human trafficking was definitely a highlight. But we also did some other important work that I'm really proud of. So we brought together a prevention education initiative. We um, worked uh, on a public-private partnership, first of its kind, with Health and Human Services to really make sure that we could get prevention information into the hands of young people. Again, going upstream and thinking about how we could build resiliency in young people and also how we could prevent exploitation. We, we didn't want people to fall into the previous traps or maybe their family has been involved in human trafficking um, or pimping for many years and or generations. We really wanted to interrupt that. And so that was another piece of our, our work that we did. And then a lot of training and more on a national level across the board and um, rural, urban, and suburban communities. We made a really um, concerted effort to make sure that professionals had the training that they needed to actually respond to human trafficking. And so those are just some of the highlights of the work that we did at the McCain Institute, but it was a tremendous effort and really set um, the stage for me to to then enter into the U.S. government from there. I started the show off by saying go orange, just now we'll get into that a little bit deeper. On to a lighter subject, you and I both have a connection to my beloved alma mater, Syracuse University. I earned my bachelor's degree there, my master's in public administration, both in the Maxwell School of Citizenship. And you started your undergrad studies there before completing your degree at another university. And now you're back as a student in the Executive Master of International Relations program. You've, you're already so accomplished. Why do you value lifelong learning? And why do you encourage others to continue their formal education? Well, Chris, as you know, I was thrown into the deep end of the pool for national security and international relations. Um, But I really, I actually started at Syracuse in high school. So they have a really great program called Project Advance. And I had taken public affairs and economics and and really loved it. But I I went on to go to another um, school from there. And that just took me on a totally different trajectory. I wanted to go back to Syracuse to get the theory and the underpinning that the Maxwell School offers. And I'm a lifelong learner, as you said, and Syracuse has significantly invested, not just in me, but also my mother who did her pre-med undergrad there as a young mom to two little girls when I went to kindergarten. And thanks to Dean Van Slyke and Dr. Mark Jacobs, I'm not just getting world-class education because as you know, Maxwell is the top ranked in the US for public affairs but also the mentoring and the sponsoring here in DC. That was a really unexpected, but fantastic value add to to my career. And I think um, each semester I'm learning something new, um, things that I wished I had known when I first went into the government, but but also just that support network. And um, I'm meeting folks who are still in the US government. It's just been a really great community and cohort of uh, other executives who I've been able to get to know. And it's just been a fantastic experience. I, I, I'm excited to take my next course this fall in strategic foresight. And so I think for me to be able to not just learn, but also to really crystallize this um theory that I have around the intersection of human rights and national security. I, you know, Syracuse has really come alongside of me to help uh, me to really prove that out. And so I'm looking forward to kind of just doing the academic work as well to support the uh, field work that I've been doing for many years now. I think you just stole my public service announcement for promoting the Maxwell School in its number one ranking. Uh, and I wouldn't do my job if I didn't give a shout out to thanking Dean David Van Slyke for introducing us. We met uh, down in DC at CSIS uh, earlier this year. So uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. And again, go orange. We have to you know, get that number one ranking going for Maxwell still. So what is the most dangerous myth about human trafficking? So we mentioned it earlier, I think we touched on it, but it's really that it only happens overseas in countries like Southeast Asia. And it can and does happen in your community. I think um, we have to be 
uh, brave enough to have these conversations. And I think we need to because it's happening to children and adults in our communities. And I think for us to really be able to move the needle, as you alluded to, for the next 20 years here in the United States, we have to um, be able to have conversations that may be taboo or sort of um, just not appropriate in dinner conversations. And I think there's a way to do it. I think we don't have to shock and awe people. I think we can really equip them with the safety information that's really needed. Um, so that to me, I think is is a really big uh, myth that I'm hoping to dispel and others are willing to, <laughs> to work with me on is to talk more about human trafficking and how it's happening here in our own backyard. And to that point, what do we need to do to keep people and especially children, safe and human traffickers? Prevention education is key. Um, the work that we have done across the United States, Florida, for example, has made uh, prevention education for human trafficking a mandate other uh, states have as well, California, North Carolina, and others. And I think we can do it in a way that's age appropriate, that is um, violence prevention, it's not sex education, and I think that can be culturally sensitive as well. And really empowering parents and caregivers. I think um, many parents are really struggling to know what to do with the online portion, right? I think we really need to think about not just preparing younger children, which we can and should, also equipping parents and caregivers to really arm themselves with critical information so they can also know how to keep their kids safe online and in their communities. Is there a call to action that you'd have for our audience? Absolutely. So first thing, become educated on the topic like we've talked about. Really don't avoid the issue because it's dark like I did for so many years. Um, my encouragement to you is to be proactive in identification and empowering this next generation of young people to know the signs of exploitation um, and to be able to reach out to somebody that they can trust so they can get help. And the other piece is, please share the Be Safe campaign. We'd love for you to join this global community of um, advocates and government officials who are really working to make sure that we can be a part of the response for those who are most vulnerable during this uh, war in Ukraine. And one more time, one more public service announcement. What's the website for the Be Safe campaign? It's helpforukrainians.info. And are there social media hashtags we should follow or Twitter handles? It's hashtag be safe. And then we'll be sharing the executive summary with your, you and the audience so they can check it out for themselves. Awesome. And just for our listeners and viewers, we'll also be posting that on social media as well. So you can track it down there. Thank Heather you. So Fisher, much. Thanks so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I look forward to continuing to working with you, especially through Syracuse Maxwell. Likewise, go orange. And thank you to our audience for tuning into this week's episode of Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place, with another leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.